Good morning. Welcome to the Calvary Missionary Methodist Church Sunday morning, May the 3rd, 2020 service. We're so glad you've joined us today. Thank you for taking the time to tune in. We are so blessed to know that so many of you are watching from your homes here locally as a part of the church congregation, and then many friends, family, and particular uh, individuals that perhaps we've never met before are tuning in as well from other states and of other cities and counties, and we just want to say thank you for hearing the Word of God. Uh, we uh, want to extend a word of thanks, especially to those of you who've never joined us before or maybe have just recently. Welcome in the name of Jesus. We pray that the Word of God is instructing, encouraging, reproving, and rebuking you and setting you up uh, in ways of uh, correction and direction and, and exaltation in life that only God and His Word can do. Uh, as uh, we uh, want to recognize those who are joining us, particularly from other uh, places around the state and around other states as well, I just want to say some of them are family that know me. Some or others have just been acquaintances who've gotten to know me. Uh, or some of you might have just been shared this video uh, or these videos in uh, recent weeks and you've been joining in. So thank you for taking the time to do that. I pray that you will continue to be a part of us. We were going to continue to do this even after we get back into having our regular worship services. And that's going to be very soon, I believe. I'm really praying about that because I uh, read something yesterday from Matt Staver of the Liberty Council talking about how that churches have a constitutional right to meet and gather an assembly. And so I'm really just praying about this, and I'm going to consult with our ministry council about this, of when we need to be opening back up and uh, offering services. I want to uh, remind everyone about a couple of prayer requests. I do ask that you continue to pray for our dear brother, Albert Holder. Brother Albert is one of the elder gentlemen in our church, one of the statesmen, one of the pillars of the church. He had recently been in the hospital last weekend. And uh, let's pray that he's healed and well. When I called to check on him the other day, his son Tony said that he was out in the shop. And I said, well, if he's in his shop, we know he's doing well. Also, let's pray for F.J. White. Uh, he is Mary Mackey's brother. He's terminally ill with cancer and nearing the end of the way. Let's pray that God will give him grace. And most of all, that he'll be sure that his calling and election with Christ is, has been made and called. Also, uh, Jerry Jacobs, that's someone I've met recently, I was just at his home uh, yesterday. He is terminally ill with neurocarcinoma. He loves Jesus. Um, he, he's nearing the end of the way. Let's pray God will give him grace as he uh, is translated from this life into eternity. Also, the Joey Collins family. Joey is Helen Eady's son-in-law. That's her daughter, uh, Renee's husband. He was found dead last Sunday. Let's pray for that family. Let's keep praying for Patricia Gregory and her health issues as she's getting ready to go back to work, hopefully this week. We love you, Sister Patricia. Also, I want to express our deepest sympathies to Sister Betty Haymore and uh, also Sister Timmer Jamerson and, of course, uh, Betty's sister Linda and, of course, Tony's wife, Sonia. As they lost Tony, he was the one in Florida who was on a ventilator after contracting the coronavirus in Florida. While they're working, he was originally from North Carolina, but had wor went there to work, re contracted the virus, and he had had diabetes and some other underlying uh, health issues that uh, exacerbated the situation, and he ended up succumbing to his illness, passed away this week, and so this past week, and we certainly extend our deepest sympathies to that entire family. Also, I want to praise God that Chris Hogarth and her husband out in Indiana are doing well, and also our dear brother Jimmy Rudisel in Cherryville, North Carolina, back to normal. Praise God. Let's pray his family will navigate on through this and get back to normal in every way. To his dear wife and his son as well, we know that they were a part of this as well with him. Also, let's pray for our president, uh, Donald Trump. I just want to say again, I cannot overemphasize how important this is. Donald Trump needs to be reelected. Our nation is under an, a spiritual, dark, wicked, horrific, horrible, and hideous assault from the wicked leftists who want to turn our nation into a godless, secularist, humanistic, evolutionary philosophy type of society. And they want nothing to do with God. The Democratic Party has made it clear they want God out of everything. And that's why I want to say to you as Christians, and I'm not endorsing every Republican out there, but I will say this, the Republican Party has said we want God involved. And so that leaves us no choice but to vote for the ones who will stand for righteousness. And let me just say the Republican Party's been doing a much better job than the Democratic Party has done. 
uh, about all of this, inclu including the payroll protection plan, the stimulus package, the cure of uh, COVID. The president's done a tremendous response, biggest response in a health crisis in the history of the world. Uh, he's praying in the name of Jesus, invoking the name of Jesus in his office and has had pastors pray extemporaneously over him, is a man of faith, has his own personal pastor there in the, at the White House working with him, other pastors advising him. And I'm going to tell you, the economy will tank, will tank, not, not just because of COVID, if Donald Trump does not get reelected. Our, our nation will be in for horrible days. And if you can't see that, you've got your head in the sand. And I was listening even to a tech gentleman that's not even – Per, per se, a, a religious individual, but he was talking about the prowess that Donald Trump has in economics and how that his economic policies as a president has set up the stock market for extraordinary success. In fact, there have been 32 records set in the first three years of his being in office. The records, he believes, are going to be reset again, perhaps many times. Uh, the, and he say, even says that Donald, Trump's, uh, Donald Trump will possibly go down in American history as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, president ever. But not just for the economic prowess, but for so many other reasons. He has reopened religious liberty, took down uh, some egregious uh, Barack Obama policies that were attacks on religious freedom as well as other things. He's dismantling all of this deep state stuff. He's doing a lot. He's not a bureaucrat. He's not an entrenched politician. He doesn't need politics to survive. It's not a power grab. He loves America. He's real rebuilding the inf infrastructure. So many reasons we need to pray for our president. He's been a ho under horrendous attack. The media wants to destroy this man. Does he have a tainted past and people want to throw that up? Yes, he does. But he's been forgiven. And I liken Donald Trump to King Cyrus of the Persian Empire who had sympathy over the people of, of Israel when he overtook Neb uh, excuse me, the uh Babylonian Empire, which was started by King Nebuchadnezzar when the exile took place, when he deported the people from Jerusalem, the likes of, of uh, Daniel, and of course you know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Hebrew names, uh, over into uh, Babylon. Well, the Persians overcame by Babylon, King Cyrus. He was sympathetic to the Jewish people, allowed them to return in 538 B.C. to their home of Judah in, in the city of Jerusalem. And because of that, King Darius came behind him around 520 to 516 and allowed the temple then to finish construction and be rebuilt. God used Cyrus to bring his people out of exile back to where they need to be. And I believe that God is using Donald Trump to help our nation and help the Christian cause particularly because God is sovereign. He's the governor, ruler, and president of all the world. He is not. He can't be voted in. He can't be voted out. Won't be impeached. Can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. I believe that God's allowed Donald Trump to be there, and I believe that every Christian ought to awaken and understand the attack that's going on right now. If you can't see this, you are spiritually blind, and you need to have your eyes opened. It's as clear as the nose on my face. God has been speaking to me very vehemently lately. Our president needs to be defended. He needs to be voted for, and he needs to be supported because he's going to give back the ability for the pastors to keep preaching the gospel without any uh, type of uh, inhibition or without any type of disruption, interruption, or intrusion from government authority. He's also going to allow us to continue our climb economically, and that's not my major concern, although it is a very important concern. My major concern is our spiritual condition. God will take care of his nation when his people humble themselves, pray, repent, turn from sin, and come to him. He will heal the land. But God has allowed this man to be put in office. We need to pray for him. Pray for Vice President Mike Pence, who's also a believer, and his dear wife. And also, let's pray for their wives and their families. Can you imagine being married to and having a family around someone with such pressure and criticism? It has to be tough. Let's ask God to help them. We need, I'm going to ask you to not make jokes about, don't try to, and, and don't diminish the value of what the president's doing. It's a very high office that God's allowed him to, to serve. He's a servant of, our, our, of the United States. He's been on the front lines every day giving 90-minute updates, not, no, uh, not a 5, 10, 15-minute update, but long updates and taking all kinds of, of shooting questions from the media who, for the most part, don't like him. And yet he stood up to them. He's been very honest. We praise God for a man that's got the backbone of steel to stand up in the midst of this. We need to pray for him that God will fortify him, protect him, and bring us through to the other side. Can I get anybody to say an amen in the house of God? 
Uh, come on, you need to be posting some amens, praise God, and hallelujahs. And I, I want to say on a personal level, I believe he's probably going to be one of the greatest presidents we've ever known because of his religious concerns and sympathies of the church. And I know that firsthand because I've been on phone calls when he's come on. I've also uh, read articles, and I'm familiar with different things that are going on behind the scenes that quit listening to the media outlets. They're just misinforming you. Quit getting your information on social media. Get it from true, reliable sources. Also, let's pray for our essential workers, our uh, health care workers, truckers, food store operator, uh, operators, and employees, emergency personnel, public safety officials, all those that are out there continuing to be the veins and arteries of our nation. Let's pray that our nation will get back to normal. As I've said before, I'm going to say it boldly again. I don't intend to quit hugging necks and shaking hands. I've even hugged some necks here even yesterday when I visited some people. Uh, we're covered by the blood of Jesus. And if you use proper hygiene, and I'm not trying to say do something ignorant, but I am simply saying to you, I'm not going to let this change me. I'm not going to let the government reprogram who I am. And let me just say to you, there is an attempt going on to reprogram who we are and how we behave. We do not need to let, do not need to let this happen. And I do believe that very soon we're going to be reopening these doors of this church. Let's pray. Let's get back into being who we are and what we should be. Also, let's pray for our nation. I cannot overemphasize enough how important it is for you. I'm talking to you right now. I'm talking to you that's listening to me right now. Those of you that are watching on YouTube or on Facebook, I'm talking to you. Two things here. Number one, some of you haven't been tuning in because you've gotten out of a routine. Let me just say... When, it was, when you used to come to church here on Sunday mornings, you came here every Sunday morning, and you sat here and listened. Some of you haven't been tuning in regularly on Sunday morning, on Wednesday night, Sunday night or Wednesday night like you used to, and you've gotten out of the habit. Let me just go ahead and say to you, shame on you. You need to get back into that routine. You need that routine. You need that discipline, and you need to get back into sitting with God's people together at the same time hearing the Word of God. Furthermore, as I've been seeking the face of God in fasting and in prayer and in studying of the Word of God, I've been asking God to give me His heart and what He wants me to speak with these lips that He's given me, with the words that He's put in my mind, in my heart, in my mouth, to be able to speak to you the Word of God. I'm asking that every one of the church people would take seriously what's going on and that we cannot get lackadaisical, we cannot get lazy, and we cannot become uh, if I can say dilatory in our responsibility of duty here. We do not need to be found in dereliction of duty. So get back to being a part of the church by listening. Some people not even watching Sunday night, Wednesday night uh, Bible studies. And I just want to say to you, it breaks my heart because, listen, there is so much that God's trying to say. And I believe if you're going to hear what God's trying to say, quit watching the media outlets and start listening to your pastor. Start listening to the Word of God. Instead of listening to the wrong voices, you're tuning in to the wrong things. You need God's heart and God's mind on the matters that are being dealt with in this moment. Let me just give that as a word of rebuke, a word of reproof, but also a word of exhortation. I want to thank those who've been very faithful. Some people that have never even been in these doors have been very faithfully watching. And I, I talked to someone who's a neighbor and a friend yesterday didn't even know that they were watching. He said, I've been, they said, well, we've been watching you on, on uh, the uh, Facebook, listening to your messages. I said, well, praise God. And they don't even attend this church. In fact, they're uh, part of another church. Had some other people that were part of another church saying they're listening in. And I want to thank you guys for being faithful. The church, and I want to say the church has grown exponentially here. And many of you don't know this. But the church has grown exponentially because there are people now a part of this church who we will continue to minister to via YouTube and Facebook. Even when we come back together, we're not going we're not, we're not to stop showing these videos. Two things here. Number one, I don't want you who are regular attendees to stop coming to church over all this. Overcome this. Don't let, the, let me say this. Overcome the coronavirus. Don't let the coronavirus overcome you. Let me say that one more time. Overcome the coronavirus. Don't let the uh, coronavirus overcome you. We are overcomers and more than conquerors. We need to stand up to it, not run from it. Okay, let's use wisdom. Let's stand up in the name and through the blood of Jesus Christ. I want to thank God that not one church member of Calvary Church has been infected with the coronavirus. I want to praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to put that red ribbon over your door and on the sides and claim the blood of Jesus Christ over your home. 
At least put it over the top. Put it somewhere on your doors, if not on all three sides, and plead the blood of Jesus over your family, your home, and ask God for his protection, his provision, and his, uh, also his um, promotion of your family and your life. And ask God for that prosperity to come in your life so you can fulfill his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I know life's not been ordinary. Trust me, I've been doing a lot of things on a to-do list, but I've still been here Sunday morning. I've still been here Sunday night. I've still been here on Wednesday nights. I'm still text messaging people. I'm still going to visit the sick. In fact, I'm, I, I did a funeral yesterday afternoon, and I'm visiting people that are dying. I'm going to people's homes when needed to talk to them and pray with them. I'm still being about the Father's business. Some of you need to get back to some regular business and get away from your fearful uh, way of life. This has turned many people into germaphobes. Now, I'm not saying that's a, a bad thing to learn good hygiene. Some of you probably need to learn better hygiene anyway. However, if we can let this make us better, but we must not let this make us bitter. We cannot let this change who we are fundamentally. So we need to let this turn into something good, not something evil. Evil. Step up on it as a stepping stone, not let it become a stumbling block. I, in Jesus' name, will not let this def de de defy or determine who I am in Christ and what I do for Christ. So, as the churches, let's get back to preaching the Word of God. I need everybody. That's the second thing. We need to be praying and repenting of our personal sins. If this hasn't awakened you and all you're doing is sitting back grumbling, complaining, and griping, and just becoming uh, sick with cabin fever uh, and wanting to get out and do things, and all you're trying to do now is get into uh, that self-preservation mode and that self-pity uh, mode, get out of that. Find yourself getting... Uh, full of the Spirit, full of the Word of God, and listening to what God is trying to say about who you are, what you're doing, and how that relates to His body, the church. So when we come back together, we can experience the Shekinah glory of God, the power of God, the presence of God, the promises of God, the prosperity of God upon His church. That's what I'm praying for in Jesus' name. Let's continue to check on each other, support one another, love one another. Now I understand there are people with underlying health issues, immunosuppressed people, diabetes, heart problems, lung problems. We understand uh, we shouldn't be coughing on people. We shouldn't be going places if we're sick and running a fever, all those things. I got that. We ought to be doing that every day of the year, every year of our lives. But we need to understand that we, the numbers don't add up with what's being presented, okay? You and I have got to realize this is not the end of the world and the sky is not falling. Let's move forward. Don't forget the office hours. For those of you that want to continue to contribute, thank you. We ended up being over $1,000 over budget for the month in, uh, of uh, April, and I want to say thank you for those who gave online who perhaps were not even a part of the church, those who came and give who were a part of the church, whether online or in person. Brother Willie Jones is here Monday through Thursday from 8 until 12 to take your phone calls, to take your contributions, make sure they get to the bank, and all that's handled. We had our ministry council meeting last week. We're talking about trying to move forward. That's going to be done hopefully real soon. And again, 8 to 12, Monday through Friday, Brother Jones will be here to help you out. And of course, text me, call me if you need me. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your faithfulness. I want to recognize birthdays. We have a couple this week. We have Christian Nouns. Uh, happy birthday, Christian on uh, Monday the 4th. Also, James Branson, happy birthday, James, on the 6th. And then my sister Cheryl, howdy, Cheryl. I said that in a southern way, howdy. Um, I want to say happy birthday to you, Cheryl. I know uh, how old you are. I'm not going to say that here on live Facebook and on YouTube, but happy birthday to you this Saturday the 9th. We love you. All right. Stay active and then stay in a good routine. Get your vitamin D, your vitamin C, and your vitamin A. Get out in the sunshine. The sunshine gives you vitamin D, and it helps to kill this virus. So get out there and expose yourself to the sun, okay? Keep tuning in and sharing on Facebook and YouTube, please. And then I want to give you one last thing. We have, I have a list of, uh, uh, of memory scriptures that came from the Voice of the Martyrs. Some of you may not be familiar with the Voice of the Martyrs. You can look them up at voiceofthemartyrs.com or vom.com. Uh, com, Bo Voice of the Martyrs, and uh, Voice of the Martyrs was started by uh, Richard Wormbrandt, uh, Tortured for Christ is a book, and you, you might want to check that out. It's a good book to read concerning a, a, a man's faith who uh, helped to start what's called the Voice of the Martyrs, but there is a publication that's provided to us by the Voice of the Martyrs that's called Memorize God's Word with Iranian Christians. If you'll go to thevoiceofthemartyrs.com, 
and uh, pull it up. You should be able to access. Just ask the Iranian memory verses, Iranian Christians Bible memory verses. And the, it's 125 Bible verses that these Iranian Christians are putting into their hearts so that even if they don't have a Bible and if they get thrown in prison, they have these scriptures in their mind and in their heart that they can quote and that they can stand on, trust the Word of God. And listen, one of the problems in America, we have Bibles, retreats, seminars, churches, all kinds of events, but yet we haven't taken the Word of God and put it into our hearts. Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word, O God, have I hid in my heart so that I might not sin against God. That is a pledge that we do even during vacation Bible school perhaps you did when you grew up and we need to let the word of God Psalm 119 verse 105 thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path you and I need to hide it in, in our hearts Joshua 1 8 this book of the law shall not me, uh, shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night to observe to do according to all that's written therein for then you'll make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success the way to success is God and his word hallelujah all righty, it's time to get into the message for today. I want to ask you a question. I hope you have your Bible out. I hope you've got your pen. I hope you've got some, something to take notes with. There's not a, a transcript on the, the church website, or excuse me, not website, the church Facebook page where the, the daily devotion is being posted. By the way, I hope you've been reading those, looking at the pictures. I appreciate my son Joseph technically putting those up every day, putting a scripture up. Uh, we, we missed Thursday. We just had a lot of events going on. But almost every day, Monday through Friday, we have a devotion for you. And those of you that would like to go back on the fasting ones, they're up there as well. All you could do is scroll through. And I hope you're utilizing those. But there will be no transcript for today. But if you'd like to have some notes, I hope you'll take them with a pen and paper. And listen, we're going to go through several scriptures, so pay attention. We're going to hit the ground running here. This is called the sermon title, What Does Church Mean to You? What does church mean to you? That's an important question. Let's take a moment and let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, as we're about to read your word, as we're about to go into this time, this segment of a sermon, we pray that you would anoint us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you give us articulation of words, fluency of speech. God, give us clarity of thought, but most of all, give us, give us the anointing of the Holy Spirit above all things, and that your word would be proclaimed and that your people would hear it, be instructed with it, encouraged, reproved, and rebuked, and prepared as servants of God to serve you in this dark world as the light and salt of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. The word church is found in the New Testament 80 different times. That's in the singular, church. 80 different times in the New Testament. 37 times in the plural, church is. C-H-U-R-C-H-E-S. 37 times. The church has a long-standing history that dates all the way back to the first century A.D. That first century when Jesus died and then his church was empowered by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, from that point forward the church was not only empowered, it went forth to, com to perform its commission that Jesus had given in Ma uh, Matthew uh, 28 and Mark 16. We read about that in the book of Acts as the history of the early church. There was no Catholic and no Protestant distinctions. There was no such thing as denominational divisions. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, and one Father who is above all, in all, and who uh, is within those, who, all of those who know him. That's the born-again believer. That doesn't mean that he's in everybody, whether you're saved or lost. What it means, he's the Lord of all that are his. There is no distinction and no denomination in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these things have come about over the centuries since the early church history of Acts because of man's ideology, philosophy, and school of thought. You have those who follow John Calvin, and you have those who are Armenian. You have those that believe in the gifts of the Spirit, those who don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. You have those that believe in predestination and those who don't believe in predestination. You have those that argue, and that's the, the most controversial subject in the entire Christendom. But I just want to say to you, brothers and sisters, it's time for the church to get back to its roots and quit following man's ideology. Paul dealt with the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 when he said, some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Cephas, others say I'm of Christ. He said, is Christ divided? No. 
He's not divided. And he said, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you except for this one, this one, this one. And listen, it is the preaching of the cross that is to them that perish foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1.18, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. The church means something. The church is not man's organized religion, as some have supposed. If you know anything about Scripture, you know Jesus instituted the church, and in Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18, he said these words. He said that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, he's talking about himself, the, the rock Christ. I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now, Peter is not the one Jesus built the church on. Peter is one of the apostles Jesus used to build the church. The foundation is Christ. Paul says that. There is no other foundation laid than that which is laid, and the man Jesus Christ is that foundation. The church is not built upon Curtis Norris. It's not built upon the apostle Peter. It's not built upon the apostle Paul. It's not built on any other name, whether it's Billy Graham or any other great name of, of yesteryear or current times. The church is built upon the only name that matters, and that name is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one true church, and that's through Christ our Lord. And there's only one Bible. The Bible is the basis of all Christian doctrine and practice. The Greek word for church is ekklesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. This word simply means a calling out. In other words, you can't be a part of the church unless God calls you out. You've got to be called out of darkness into his light, 1 Peter 2, 9. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people who has called out of darkness to show forth his praises and his marvelous light. We are called out by Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 16, excuse me, John 15, verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have ordained you that you go and bear forth fruit and that your fruit might remain. Again, that is John chapter 15, verse number 16. The second definition of this word in the Greek means an assembly. It means a, a, an assembly, a coming together, a body, a, an infrastructure of the people of faith. The church is God's institution. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said these words before he ascended. Jesus said, And you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, home base, uh, Judea, Judea, surrounding neighborhoods, and Samaria, that's the places you don't want to go. Samaria, the Jews didn't want to go to Samaria. In John 4, Jesus went to Samaria, met the woman, had been married five times, living with a man, changed her life, and she came to the well with a water pot and left with the well. And then he said, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, to all the world. That's the Great Commission. And from Acts 1-8 all the way to Acts 8-1, they stayed in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 3, great persecution through even a man named Saul of Tarsus was enacted by God to allow them to then be dispersed because the Bible said, and they, the laity, went everywhere. They moved out of Jerusalem preaching the word of God, but the apostles remained in Jerusalem to teach the word of God and to be those who would oversee as episcopus, overseers of, of the faith, bishops of Christ. The church is comprised of three basic groups. Number one, the saints that are already in heaven, those who've died and gone on before us. They're not dead. They're not laying in a grave. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The body goes back to the ground from which it came, Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the body return to the dust from which it came, and the spirit to the God which gave it. So the spirit of the departed is with the Lord. In Matthew 17, we see Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're not dead. They're alive. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. There's going to come a general resurrection where all the bodies of the saints will rise. There'll be a rapture of the church that at, the same, uh, at that time, a rapture of the church, a resurrection of the saints, and there'll be a reunion in the presence of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And that what happens in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. You and I must understand then the saints that are in heaven are a part of the church. They're still, they're cheering us on. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, prior to that, chapter 11, he names all the way from Abraham all the way down uh, to the, the great faith of David and Samson and Jephthah and those who subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, stopped the mouths of lions, uh, quenched the violence of fire, 
turned to flight the armies of the aliens, wandered about in uh, goat skins and sheep skins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. And then he goes in chapter 11, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight and the sin that does easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, the throne of God. So the saints in heaven, the predecessors, those who live before us have gone to be with the Lord. The second group is those who are the saints around the world collectively. Listen, there are people around the world right now that are alive that are Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, uh, people over in Laos or Laos, uh, people down in the Philippines, people down in India, people up in Russia, people over in Europe, people down in Israel, people in Iran and Iraq and Syria and Jordan and places in South America and Canada and, and American Samoa and all kinds of places, Puerto Rico, there's uh, in Haiti and, and Dominican Republic, all over the world, people that know and love the Lord Jesus Christ that have been born again. And we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're the salt of the world and we are called the universe church and then we have thirdly the saints locally yes I use the word saints you're either a saint or you ain't you're either born again with the blood of Jesus or you're a depraved wicked uh, with the wrath of God individual that's upon you but a saint a saint of God has not been uh, deemed saint because they've been tapped on a shoulder by some religious hierarchy you are a saint because you've been washed in the blood of the spotless lamb of God that makes you born again births you into the church you don't join the church you get birthed into it through the uh, the blood of Jesus Christ and by the power and person of the Holy Spirit we are the saints locally, that is geographically located all around the world where like I'm standing right now in a sanctuary representing as a pastor the church, the congregation who are not here right now other than my son who's back in the sound booth right now and operating the technical things for us and supportive. We are gathering together now as the church. That's why I want to say please, please, please watch what these videos are about you need to be encouraged exhorted and instructed in your faith so the, the saints in heaven the saints around the world and the saints locally what are the three groups that make up the church we also noted the other day as you if you watched Wednesday night we noted that the city of God in Hebrews chapter 12 I'm going to go back to that in Hebrews chapter number 12 the Bible says you have come to Mount Zion Mount Zion was Jerusalem it's the, to the city of the king, to the city of the living God. So we notice, number one, that, he's the, uh, that the church is a city of the living God. If you'll go to that, Hebrews 12, 22, you'll see exactly that. You have come to Mount Zion. You've come to the real Jerusalem. People say, you want to go to the holy city? Listen, I'm going to the holy city. If I never make it to Israel, and I'm not against that. Matter of fact, I understand the significance of the holy land, as we call it. And it's a beautiful and wonderful and majestic experience to understand and to put into context and put a visual aid into your mind and heart about how these happen, things happen and when. And chronologically putting it together, it's a great experience. But I want to say to you, there's going to come a day I'm already a part of that city I'm already a citizen of that city I'm a green card carrying city citizen of Mount Zion the city of the great king the heavenly Jerusalem and God is the living God of it he's the God of the past he's the God of the present and he's the God of the future he's not dead he's ne his nerves aren't shattered his mind is not left him unable to think he doesn't develop dementia or Alzheimer's he has no cognitive impairments and he is the one whose reach reaches everywhere his weight outweighs the world his love is, is so amazing and, and, and inexhaustible. His mercy endures forever and His truth endures to all generations. That's the God. It's the living God, the God of the past, present, and future. In fact, Revelation said He's the God who was, is, and is to come, the Almighty, Revelation 1.8. He's the Alpha and Omega. And if you look in your Bible, if it's a red-letter edition, that's in red, it's signifying that Jesus is deity. He's God, Alpha, Omega, beginning in the end, first, last, he which was, is, and is to come, the Almighty God. Hebrews 13, 8, I'm the Lord God, I don't change. And then, well, excuse me, Malachi 3, 6, I'm the Lord God, I do not change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ. Look, those, look at the equivocal nature of those. Malachi 3, 6, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
So we've seen that the church is the city of God. We see it's of the heavenly Jerusalem. In other words, the heavenly city of peace. And when the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, comes, the pastor of pastors, the overseer over the overcomers, the conqueror of conquerors, the one who is the leader of the legislators, when he comes back, he will rule and reign, not in a democracy, not in a constitutional republic. He will rule as a theocracy on this earth. And all the kingdoms of the world will be his because indeed he is Lord of it all. The church is that representation here on this earth geographically located here individually, universally around the world, and the saints in heaven. But we also see there that there are angels. He said, and to countless thousands of angels. We see that angels are all over the place, and they are with us right now. And in a, a joyful gathering. Listen, we need not fear. If God is for us in Romans 8, who can be against us? Who shall any, lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justified. We should not be afraid of peril or sword. Listen, don't be afraid of the coronavirus. Don't be fr- afraid of peril or sword. The church has endured great things. Listen, brothers and sisters, the church has overcome. The church, listen, we have uh, crawled through uh, beggar's dust. Listen, we have danced in golden castles. We have crawled through beggar's dust. But today the church stands before him as she wears the righteousness of God. Why? Because we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have angelic uh, protection, angelic, if I can say, bodyguards, and we have angelic assistance with us right now. Thirdly, we see the fellow believers. He says, you have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children. That's the fellow believers. Listen, that's Hebrews 12, 23. I hope you're in your Bible right now. I hope you're taking notes. We see the fellowship of the believers. And then we see, fourthly here, you have come to the assembly of God's children, and the believers who are named are written in heaven, you have come to God himself. You have come to God himself. The church is of God, by God, for God. Just like we say the American Constitution says, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Listen, the church is of God, by God, and for God. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. We are created for him. Let me say it again. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. That's why you need to be involved with it because God is in and over him. His church. You have come to God Himself, who is the judge over all things. Praise God. Hallelujah. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. In other words, the saints of God. We have now in Colossians 1 around verses 18, 19, 20, 21 that God has made us blameless as we stand before him without a single fault. That's what the New Living Translation says. You go to James chapter, uh, excuse me, Jude, not James, Jude 24 and 25, only one chapter, Jude 24 and 25. Now, unto him that's able to present you faultless before his presence, faultless, blameless, without any sin, righteous. Only through Jesus being born again into the church can we be made righteous. Only through Jesus can our record be exonerated, can our uh, be expunged, and our uh, charges be completely exonerated of because of the blood and the sinless life of Jesus Christ, the body which he gave for us substitutionarily on the cross as our atonement. Hallelujah. Full and free salvation. And not only do we see that, we also see a couple other things. He says, you have come to Jesus. We see, not only that, we see the church triumphant here, and we see uh, Jesus Christ. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. There is no one else, Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The, the Lord of the church is Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The Lord of the church is Jesus Christ. Can anybody shout that with me right now? Anybody say a hallelujah and amen or yes, the Lord Jesus is the Lord of the church. And the church is triumphant because he's the victor that has taken us as victims. And because of us being grafted in through and to him, we are now victors ourselves. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then also we see number seven. We see here, in this same verse, he mediates the new covenant between God and the people. Hebrews is a book of covenant. Read it about it. It's about Jesus and how he's like the Melchizedek, line of priesthood without earthly father, mother, no descendants. In other words, eternal. 
Old Testament, Melchizedek, prince, a king of Salem, king of peace, Jesus, prince of peace, Isaiah 9, 6. Jesus is, was Old Testament, Melchizedek, Christophany, who met with Abraham, shared wine and bread, communion, and Abraham gave a tithe to him. He only paid tithes to God. That was Jesus Christ, my friends. He says, which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cried out from, for vengeance from the ground. He says, the blood of your brother Abel cries out to me from the ground. And he said to Cain, your, the blood of your brother. And he said, am I my brother's keeper? He said, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. I'm glad that the blood of Jesus cries out on behalf of those who are born again. There is forgiveness. Let me just say to you, if you don't know that forgiveness, no matter how tainted, no matter how wicked, no matter how horrific your past has been, even up to this very moment, you can receive by the blood of Jesus Christ an exoneration of those uh, charges against you, an expungement of your record, and you can be cleared and free and forgiven through Jesus Christ the Lord. You will become, be, be born again into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You ought to give him praise and glory. Now, I want to talk for just a few minutes about a couple other things, and I don't have much time because I don't want to keep you too long, and we need to get, I want to come back tonight, I want to make you come back to part two but the church is significant. The church has a purpose. And we're going to pick back up on some of this as we don't get it finished. But I want to go ahead and start into, we've talked about the doctrine of the church. We've talked about seven things. The church is the city of God. The church has angels. The church has fellow believers. The church is an indirect relationship to and is here because of God. The church is triumphant. The church is has Jesus Christ as, as its Lord and as its head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Colossians 1.18 says in Ephesians 1.22 and 23, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And then we also have, because of Jesus, forgiveness within his church. Those seven things, the city of God, angels, fellow believers, God himself, church triumphant, Jesus himself, and forgiveness. Praise God through he, with Hebrews 12.22 to 24 you see those things i adapted those particular points from a book by r kent hughes called the disciplines of a godly man r kent hughes k-e-n-t hughes r kent hughes disciplines of a godly man i suggest every man get that book and read it i want to talk about the second thing here the discipline of the church the number one thing that the church does when we come together is we gather to worship in john chapter 4 verse number 24 the bible says this he said god is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You can't worship God if you're not in spirit and in truth. So worship. worship. Let's talk about that word for just a moment. What does that word mean? That word in the English means this. The acknowledgement of worth or value. It is an English word that is a compound of two words, worth and ship. Worth and ship. Put the two together and you have worship. Instead of the th in there, worship. Worthship. In other words, it's exactly what the definition means. It's a combination of two words, worth and ship. You have an acknowledgement of worth, an acknowledgement of value. And I'm going to ask you again the question of the title of the sermon. What does the church mean to you? How valuable is a good pastor to you? How valuable is a good church assembly to you how valuable is the word of god to you how valuable is it for you to understand who you are in the church being a part of the church and your significant role in the church what does the church mean to you this is part two what does the church mean to you it means also in definition to regard with respect to regard with respect and honor listen the church has lost respect people today treat the church so ridiculously disrespectful they come in and act any which way, and I believe if Jesus was in our time, perhaps he would drive out some of the religious Pharisees, and he'd drive out the others who are nothing but the merchants trying to profiteer over his name. The church is of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a, supposed to be a house of prayer, but not a den of thieves. And some of the churches have den of thieves running them, overseeing them, and destroying them. It also means to treat God with reverence and adoration appropriate to his nature and character. Let me say that again. To treat God with reverence and adoration 
appropriate to his nature and character. That's worth saying again. To treat God with reverence and adoration appropriate to his nature and character. Do you treat God with reverence and adoration appropriate to his nature and character? Or are, are you one of those people that only pulls God off the shelf and applies him when you want him, when you need him, like some type of just you know, a, a canned good that you put on a shelf that you get whenever you're hungry or like something in a vending machine that you just want to put some change in like a lot of people do the offering plate and get something out of just so they can feel their momentary hunger until they can really get somewhere else. Listen, we need to quit being ecclesiastical hitchhikers and start being substantial servants of God and understand our roles within the church. The number one thing about church is an act of worship. We worship God, number one, in our characteristics, in the way we live our lives. You don't worship God at a place and at a time. You can worship God at a place and at a time, but worship is everything you do. All the words you say, the thoughts you think, and the deeds you do. Let me say that again. The words that you speak, the thoughts you think, and the deeds you do are acts of worship, and indeed the Word of God verifies that in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Not an Old Testament sacrifice. That sacrifice is for a Atonement has already been given. Jesus, he's our Yom Kippur. He's our day of atonement. But the sacrifice we give now is an offering to God where he says, let your bodies be as a living sacrifice, holy, separated, set apart for God's use, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The new living says, which is the real way to worship him. The way to worship God is by living a life that is devout and devoted and committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, not just at a place at a time and giving a little offering and going right back and reverting to your old way of life. Church is about living the way you should every day of the week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 and one quarter days of the modern day calendar. Listen, you and I need to live for Christ in everything we do in our words, our thoughts, and in our deeds. There needs to be a sanctifying identification of the children of God. So the first thing we do is we come to church and worship. And I want to give the acronym WIFE, and then I'm going to come back here this evening at 6 p.m., and you don't need to miss 6 p.m. If you've been watching this Sunday morning, you need to be back 6 p.m. God is watching you. And Matthew, uh, and, uh at 6 o'clock this evening, we'll be back on Facebook and YouTube again, going right back to this. But number one in the acronym worship, I mean, excuse me, acronym WIFE, W stands for worship. W-I-F-E. So if you're writing this on notes, put a, on down, down the margin of the left-hand margin of your paper, put W, next below it, I, below it, F, and then below it, an E. For the W, put worship, John 4, 24. Let me just say to you, the church came together in worship regularly. In the book of Acts, we read this. We'll get more to that in just a moment. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the Bible says this, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. The new living, that's the King James, the new living says it, let us not neglect our meeting together. I've already told you on the onset of this that the Greek word ekklesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, means by definition assembly. Here's what that scripture literally means. Do not stop and do not neglect meeting together as the assembly, the church, as some people do. In other words, as they were gathering in the early church. Why? But encourage one another. Why? We need each other. We need the encouragement. I'm encouraging you right now. Stand up. Stand strong. Stand. When you've done all to stand, Ephesians 6, then stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Ephesians 6, uh, 10, 11. Stand therefore. He says, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And that, listen, that ought to behoove us even more. Now that we're among this plague that's hit our, our world, and this is, listen, no matter what man has done, if it even was something that was an onset of the Chinese or if it was some other people were in, in, in joining conspiracy or an attempted coup or whatever it might be going on out there, I just want to say to you, God is going to utilize everything for his glory, for his namesake, and let's let this be the case. Even as all this is going on, let's draw together, even as we see the day of the Lord's return drawing near. Hebrews 10, 25, it's very clear. So let's debunk, debunk this idea that the church is not necessary. As I said the other night, the church is so important to the child of God, just like the gas station is to a car. How foolish would it be for a car to say, I don't need the gas station. Oh, I don't have to be uh, get a gas station to be a car. That's true. But you cannot 
effectively or even appropriately run in accordance with your design if you don't go to a gas station if you're a car. So if you're a child of God, you cannot say, I don't need the church. That's nothing but just absolute ignorance. It's just like a baby saying, okay, I'm 100% a child. I'm okay on my own. I'm independent. No, you're not. You need a family. And even as you become an adult, you establish your own family, develop your own uh, practices and traditions, but you still stay connected to the family. We all need that network, the church, as the family of God. The second thing I want you to write beside of I, instruction. I mean, we need instruction from the Word of God. You need proper, systematic, biblical theology and, and doctrine. You need that. Biblical theology and doctrine is significant to the child of God. You need to go to a church where you're going to get the Word of God, not just somebody's going to stand up and spit all over the place and yell and scream and jump and holler. That's okay if you get excited at church. I'm not against that. I get excited sometime myself. Just keep watching. You'll find that out. Come see us sometime. You'll find that out. But I'm going to tell you, I believe that the primary responsibility of a good pastor, as 1 Timothy chapter 3 says, he's got to be apt to King James, qualified other translations, to teach. He's got to be able to teach the Word of God. If you don't leave with any instruction from God's Word, all you had is an emotional experience that will die out the moment that you hit the, 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 the fan of things that are going on in this world that the enemy is going to send a wind your way and the darts that he throws at you. You've got to be properly instructed in the Word of God. So we need godly and biblical doctrine and instruction. We see this in Acts chapter 2 verse number 42. In Acts chapter 2 verse 42, the King James said they st can you continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The New Living says, and all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Doctrine means teaching. Instruction comes from teaching. Now, let me get back to this a moment. Some of you have not been watching regularly, and I just want to say to you, I love you, but shame on you. And I want to say I love you enough that if I had a belt, I'd give you a spiritual spanking because you know how frustrating it is for a pastor when he prepares and he's got a congregation he's trying to feed and you won't even show up for meal time. You won't even show up for instruction time. It'd be like a teacher, and some of you that are watching are school teachers. How important it is for that child to be there regularly? How important it is for their education? Just like right now, they're out of school, and you're concerned about those at-risk kids, those who are not getting the education online as they should be. A great probably 40% or more of them are not getting what they need right now. Some of them are going to be passed on to the next grade, and they don't deserve to be passed on to the next grade, not because you don't want them to advance. It's just they're not ready yet, and they're going to be thrown into an even much more exponentiated challenge because they're not ready for the next level of instruction because they haven't mastered this current level of instruction. Listen, some of you, you are spiritual babies, and you need godly instruction. You're still in kindergarten. Maybe you're in preschool. Some of you in first grade. Some of you may be fifth or sixth grade. Some may be out of high school and into college. Some of you may already be into your Ph.D. or whatever it may be spiritually. But I just want to say to you, we all need the instruction and the constant ingestion of the Word of God. We need a regular, healthy diet of the Word of God, the table of God. We need instruction let alone know that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible tells us this. In verses 16 and 17, and all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's the King James. The word inspiration is the word in the Greek pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, P-N-E-U-M-A, pneuma. That means the breath or air of God, the breath of God. You see, it was the breath of God that breathed life, Genesis 2, 7, into the man and became a living soul. Without the breath of God, he was just a dead corpse on the ground. Without the Spirit of God living in you, you're just a dead man walking. But when the Holy Spirit breathes life back into a man, he becomes a living soul. And the Word of God is what breathes life back into us because it informs our conscience. You see, books of the world will inform, but God's Word transforms. And God's Word informs the conscience of a person, and that's why it pricks them. That's why people don't like reading the Bible. They don't want to hear the Word of God. They don't want to hear the name Jesus invoked in the public. Why? Because it pricks their conscience. If you don't believe that, you look at the book of Acts chapter 9. When Saul is running from God, he says, he, 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 on the road to Damascus, he said to him, he said, Paul, Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, it's hard for you to fight against the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the preaching of a man named Stephen, I believe, got a hold of that man named Saul of Tarsus. And it prodded and it pricked and it poked him. And it was getting at him and it drove him into a further rebellion. But then we see God in Acts chapter 8, by the way, and after Acts 7, Stephen stoned and Saul watched and held the coats of those that stoned Stephen. But all the while his heart's being prodded, pricked and prodded and, 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 and poked. And in Acts chapter 8, we see 
that uh, this man went out, Saul, and just viciously began to persecute in the church and arrest the Christians. But in Acts chapter 9, we read where he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Let me tell you something. God's going to pull some people out of this crisis whom we thought were enemies. And, oh, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Going to bring them into the church. Glory to God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. He's going to bring them in. He's going to harness them to use like he did Moses, like he did Saul for a time as this to bring people in in this end time. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that is teaching, to teach us what's right and wrong, for instruction in righteousness, to be able to instruct us that the man of God may be, uh, may be thoroughly furnished in all good works, prepared and equipped to be the people of God in every way of life, in every good work we do, as the New Living Translation says. Listen, so put down instruction. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we are told that no prophecy of Scripture is of private interpretation. In other words, it didn't come from man's own ideology. People say the Bible's from man. No, it's not. The Bible was written on three different continents over a period of 1,500 to 2,000 years in times of, of war and in days of peace by kings, physicians, farmers, singers, shepherds, and other people of walks of life. It is so perfectly cohesive that it is unmistakable that it's divine in origin. It stood to this day, and it's the greatest book in the world, and there's more artifacts on the Bible than any book in antiquity. Don't tell me that it's of man. It is God's Word. Can anybody out there say a great big, Hallelujah! Tired of people that want to make these foolish, ignorant statements. It stands up to the scrutiny of the world, and Jesus himself even said in Luke 21, 33, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And Jesus taught in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. don't have time to read it at the moment, but I want you to note it. To go and teach all nations. Give them biblical theological doctrine. Teach all nations. The same thing in Matthew 16, or Mark 16, when he said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. Listen, we must get instruction. Baptize them in, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28. And he that believeth that is baptized, the same shall be saved, Mark 16, 15. Verse 16. Now let's go to the, the F on the word wife, fellowship. We'll go back to Acts chapter 2, verse number 42. You and I need good fellowship. For the Bible says, and they continued steadfastly the apostles' doctrine and in breaking the bread in fellowship. That word fellowship in the Greek is koinonia, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. That word literally means in the Greek social Intercourse. Let me just say to you, in a time when Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, and all these doctors are saying social distancing, let me debunk that and say, let's stop using the word social distancing. If you need physical distancing, fine. But we need social intercourse. That means we've got to get close and personal. The word intercourse is a word of intimacy, and we must have social intimacy. And let me just furthermore say, you can't really have good sexual intimacy in the marriage bed and in the marriage relationship if you don't have good social intercourse first. Social intercourse is the infrastructure that holds relationships together. And how dare we even think of destroying social? That's an enemy's lie. I just want to say in Jesus' name, you go back to hell where you came from, devil. We're not going to quit social uh, in, uh, intercourse. We're going to keep being intimate in our social dealings with people. Can I hear an amen from anybody in the house of God? Somebody ought to be just shouting about right now. Maybe you want to take a dance around your living room floor, wherever you're at. Just praise God. We need fellowship. And listen, that fellowship means we've got to spend some time together. Jesus, even before he died, wanted to have fellowship with those around the table and eat the bread and drink the wine. And, and in Revelation 3, uh, 19 and 20, I, I stand at the door and knock. He stands at the church. He says, if any man open the door. In Malachi, he says, I wish somebody would go and shut the door in chapter 2 of the temple. Why? Because these people are offering me detestable sacrifices, the blind, the maimed, and, and those that are diseased. God says, you've been offering him the less than the best for long enough. He shut the doors, and he's saying, it's time to open the doors back up to give your best. Stop giving God your leftovers. Stop giving God the rest of your life. Give God the best of your life. Don't you dare 
spend the flower of your life on your own selfish pursuits and then hand the stem to God and blow a sm the smoke of a misfit life in the face of God. The last thing, evangelism. As I said a moment ago in Matthew 28, he said, go into all the world and teach all nations. How many know the world needs to hear? In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, and when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, then the end shall come. Let me just say to you, the word wife, worship, I, instruction, F, fellowship, E, evangelism. We must take the gospel to the world. Right now, the world is open. Right now, as Pastor Greg Laurie said the other night on TBN, and I agree with his assessment of this, it's like people hear all of a sudden the captain come over the loudspeaker on an airplane and, and say two of our four engines have gone out, and all of a sudden it's heightened people's uh, uh, alertness and awareness and conscientiousness about what he's saying because I better pay attention to what they're about to tell me because this may get rough, it may get bad, and we could die. And people right now are at that place in life, and they're tuning into the Word of God. The people by the millions are listening into like Harvest Ministries of Greg Laurie out of California, places, uh, other pastors around the nation. They're tuning in, and like us here, they're tuning in on Facebook and YouTube, and they're listening. Let me just say to you, right now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Get it right. What does the church mean to you? It's time to quit living for yourself and get in a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching church and begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit and live a Spirit-filled life. Quit living for yourself. What does the church mean to you? Let's come back together tonight. Let's talk about that. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, would you speak to every heart? I pray that they will rejoin us this evening at 6 p.m. and that uh, they'll grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, as 2 Peter 3.18 says. I pray for anybody right now that's watching that they'll say, Jesus, I'm lost. Lord, I've been backslid. I've turned away from you. I ask you right now you'd forgive me, return me to you, O oh God. Draw me by your Holy Spirit because I can't come on my own. Renew me, refresh me, revive me, God. Purge me, purify me, prepare me as a person of God, as a disciple of God, to be your child of God in the church of the living God. And may I value the church like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. Be sure to join us again this evening, 6 p.m. Thank you for joining